Hi everybody, this is Aaron Murakami, and this is uh, Monday, March 30th, and I have Eric Dollard on the line. Okay, um, so on this call, um, we're going to talk a little bit about J.J. Thompson. J.J. Uh, Thompson was a, uh, a scientist early in the, I don't know, was it maybe late 1800s, early 1900s? Um, yeah, kind of he, get, reached, he reached his peak about 1900. Now, he's the one who's credited with dis discovering the electron? That's correct. And um, what else about him is significant, and why do people need to know who J.J. Thompson is? Well, it's, it's kind of a broad situation. It's hard to pin it down to one word or two sentences or whatever. But basically, J.J. Thompson adhered to the Faraday concept of electricity where everybody else started to deviate into uh, you know, the Einsteinian relativities and action at a distance and what have you. So Thompson, unlike Maxwell, did not uh, approach this thing from a purely mathematical standpoint, but he approached it from an experimental and a more empirical standpoint and developed the Faraday lines of force idea into virtually an ether physics. Mm -hmm. And that aspect of his work is not very well uh, very well known about. Now, also, J.J. Thompson can be credited with establishing the entire basis for atomic science and the notions of the relativists and a lot of other people that are making claims to, you know, quantum theory and, and energy mass equivalencies and, uh, and limiting speeds of the velocity of light is all that can be traced to J.J. Thompson. He's the true originator of all of those concepts. So right now you're currently um, working on uh, some concepts relating to J.J. Thompson. Um, what, what exactly or what parts of his work are you currently studying or exploring? Well, the book on the last presentation and the last presentation uh, a lot of that material rested heavily on the notion of electricity as conceived by J.J. Thompson. So now the whole layout and plan of this book on the presentation, the title of the book is The History, Theory, and Practice of Electrical Transmission, and the last presentation, which directed that towards Tesla and Alexanderson, is to step-by-step -step from very, very basic levels of understanding, uh, establish all the principles of electrical transmission, and what is capacitance, what is inductance, what is resistance, and not by you know, some simple little, you know, half-baked analogy, but to, to actually you know, like be able to feel and touch and smell these things so that you have an intimate knowledge of them. And in order to do this, uh, the Thompson theory of the ether and the Faraday tubes of force is essential because it gives substance to electricity rather than it being, you know, a mathematical abstract of curved space like Einstein wants to tell us. So what I've done in the book, which basically is the presentation, but, you know, in its full form that I didn't have time or the energy to present in four hours, is... Um, is to get a, a full understanding of each and every aspect. So now I've gotten to the point in the book where we really need to know what this stuff is between the wires because now we're at the point in the book we have to calculate uh, how much energy is lost in heating the wires and how much energy is in whatever form pushing them apart and putting them together. So that requires a model of the ether in between the wires. So the one person that accomplished that is J.J. Thompson. Uh, he wrote a very large book, Recent Researches into Electricity and Magnetism, where he devotes uh, a few chapters in their entirety to the concept of Faraday tubes and the ether physics that goes along with them. So I've reached the point where I have to go through all that and turn it from... Uh, uh, complex calculus equations and incomplete descriptions and wordings and lacks of diagrams and all that into a, a geometrical and algebraic uh, presentation on the subject. So that's what I'm engaged in right now. So
so that you can actually tangibly have an experiential understanding of electricity, that it's something uh-huh. there. It's not an right. abstract thing. It's actually there, and it has this whole dynamics. The ether has a whole dynamics. Uh, unfortunately, the ether still has to remain undefined, but the fact that it does have specific characteristics and laws that it adheres to in an electrical form and with relation to gravity and with relation to electrical, to mechanical forces like in motors and what have you and solenoids, then it's, uh, it all rests on those chapters. So that's what I'm engaged in now, and I've managed to break through the barrier and convert a lot of it into geometry and algebra. And uh, it's fascinating the the knowledge that I'm getting out of the process. So J.J. Thompson is the central figure in this. Uh, what's interesting is the way I came about uh, getting involved in his work was first in my original studies as instigated by Philo Farnsworth. Thompson was the guy that really stuck with the Faraday lines of force theory, so I stuck with it, and I wrote a paper a long, long time ago about capacitance. I think it was the first paper I wrote uh, in to show Philo, you know, that I was making progress in this and what he thought about it, and Thompson was the center of that. I think, uh, I forget the exact title, but, you know, it's available on the Internet and Borderland attempts to sell it, even though it's for free now for everybody. But I hadn't really got too excited about Thompson until uh, one morning a friend of mine and I were having our morning uh, philosophical conversation over coffee, and uh, he pulled out a book with a cartoon character of Einstein and some other stuff on it, and it said Occult Ether Physics. And uh, I told my friend Joe, you know, I'm not into any of that UFO stuff, Joe. And he's going, no, he goes, this book's saying exactly what you're saying. And I go, yeah. And he goes, look, really, it is. you know. And I go, Joe, I don't believe it. So at any rate, uh, you know, he goes, well, read the book. So I open it up and start looking, and it's a book by William Lyne. And lo and behold, everything that, that I had stumbled across with the uniqueness of J.J. Thompson's work, uh, he puts it in very clear uh, layman form, and it really kind of blew me away and got me to really uh, – gave me a renewed interest in J.J. J. Thompson and to start doing experiments, uh, you know, that were like his experiments. And Thompson really uh, stood side by side with Nikola Tesla. And even though the, the conclusions of, you know, of, of what they observed in their experiments may have been different, those were the two guys, and it all – ultimately found its way, its its origin, all came from uh, one particular individual, which was uh, Sir William Crookes, and started the vacuum tube idea and vacuum tube research that Thompson and Tesla took to levels that, uh, that no one's fully grasped to this day, and also demonstrate that a lot of the concepts of radiation and, and, and those type of things as they're understood today are, are, are completely false. Uh-huh. Now so this, the particular um, the particular interest uh, in the occult ether physics book is that inertia has mechanical momentum, and that you can store momentum and energy in the ether and recover it at a later point, and you can manipulate this momentum and you can you know synthesize it and neutralize it, and in that way you can have uh, mechanical movements and propulsions that uh, that do not involve energy consumption, because you you can neutralize inertia, and that is an absolutely fantastic concept. Right. So, with um, day before yesterday, I was talking to William Lyon. Um, he's he's going to be coming to the uh, 2015 Energy Science and Technology Conference, uh, also to do a talk. Um, and uh, his talk is going to be on J.J. Thompson. Yeah, that'll be perfect. <laughs> yeah, because so with, I'm going to um, get into, you know, the uh, the Faraday tube idea because I have to give some kind of grasp of how the ether can act on matter. 
and also then how electricity and music can act on matter because the basic idea in this presentation is we have this assertion that the Egyptians raised the stones uh, through music, and there's been other indications of this, and the Pythagorean understanding of music uh, also led to a lot of uh, interesting power of music type of situations, uh, the, the walls of Jericho being the one that people are most familiar with. So how does an engineer get a grasp of such a thing and then explain it to the layman? It's going to be an interesting challenge. But J.J. Thompson uh, sits very squarely in this as well as Pythagoras. So Pythagoras handled it from the symbolic level, but J.J. Thompson handled it from the physics level. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the name of the um, the, the book by J.J. Thompson that you're um, with those chapters? And it's a pretty pretty big book. Uh, the one, the one I'm studying right? now is, is the big one. Anybody could de dedicate their whole life to it. So mm -hmm. I'm not ready to dedicate my whole life to it because... The older mathematics and the lack of uh, units and dimensions and all that type of stuff make it way too difficult to deal with. But the physics part of it, you know, and the experiments, uh, you know, the descriptions of lines of force and all that in the beginning, that's what I'm concentrating on. And it's Thompson's main work is called Recent Researches in Electricity and Magnetism. And it's about like 800 pages. Yeah, it's pretty heavy duty and a lot of math in there, but there is a simpler book um, that pretty much anybody can understand because it's not um, math heavy. It's more what, philosophy and, and, and that kind of thing where he explains a lot of his ideas on these concepts, and that's called Electricity and Matter. Yeah, Electricity and Matter. It was a, a series of lectures he gave uh, orientated you know, to the popular audience and not the scientific audience, and uh, there was... Uh, a yearly grant that was uh, was provided for somebody to do this, and he got that grant one year and gave a series of lectures uh, very similar to what Steinmetz did in his Impulses, Waves, and Discharges. And uh, it's, it's very, very little mathematics in there. It's mostly just elementary algebra and geometry where he uh, represents his ideas, you know, of... Uh, the momentum of the ether and the lines of force and their behavior, uh, basic you know atomic principles, uh, the discovery of the electron and these type of things. It's, it's not difficult to understand it. I mean, it, you do have to concentrate on it. And the problem with Thompson's mathematics is uh, even the simple stuff can be hard to understand because there was no uh, established system back then, like I've established in my writings, you know, is every letter of the Greek and Roman alphabet has a very specific meaning, and, and it's not interchangeable. Uh, Thompson will use, you know, the variable X for three different things in one chapter, so that's why I usually go through these things like I'm doing with the big book and rewrite all of the equations in standard notation and make them dimensionally consistent, and then they are understandable. Now, what is your understanding of the, the so-called um, Tesla's dynamic theory of gravity, which was never really published? He made some uh, references to it. Um, can you go into some of that? Well, I like to think that I pretty much have read everything that Tesla wrote. I tried to read everything that Tesla wrote, and I found you know, a good repository of it in San Francisco Public Library before Diane Feinstein trashed the contents and removed all this material. I had that lucky interval, just like Jerry Vassilatos did in New York Public Library. And uh, let's see. Now, let's go back to the original question again, because I've also defined the, defined the terms. About the uh, dynamic theory of gravity? Oh, uh, yeah, I've, never seen, I've never, seen any, never ever seen any evidence of Tesla describing a dynamical system of gravity. Mm -hmm. So it most likely was some, just something that Tesla alluded to in those teases he would do with the newspaper reporters, you know, during his uh, internal exile here in the United States where he was feeding about pigeons the air, on park benches. About the airships and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's not really, I can't identify 
anything there to uh, to describe or work with because it just didn't really encounter. He didn't talk about that. So with the science of uh, gravity, um, so would you say that J.J. Thompson is probably the, the main one to study to get a grasp on on all of this? Well, now, now Thompson was electrical and not gravitational, and ultimately uh, gravitational is so... It's like it's like the ether itself. It's just uh, it, it doesn't lend itself to comprehension. So Thompson does not get into any uh, gravity equations or any of that type of stuff. So and and I don't either. But uh -huh. but these things do pop up in the course of this. Uh, Steinmetz came up with some very interesting relationships that would indicate that electrical forces would behave differently on different planets due to the gravitational constant of the planet. So if you built a motor on Earth, uh, it would not behave the same way on Jupiter, uh, which is a kind of interesting idea. Of course, it's typical of Steinmetz to use, you know, kanky dimensions and not describe where he got things from, to take mathematical shortcuts. So I have no idea how he came up with this idea, but at any rate, it's in the equation. So his equations... On, on the forces that electricity exerts on matter were the only ones I found useful for engineering purposes. The ones in the physics books are worthless. The dimensions don't add up, and uh, and they're all related towards things that, that have no physical existence in the electrical engineering world. They're all physical ab physics abstractions of things that can't physically exist, which is very typical in that science, point charges and test poles and all this stuff that can't possibly physically exist, but they use these things to define their terms. Well, Steinmetz took a different approach, and fortunately, I ran across that. Otherwise, this endeavor of trying to you know, connect the electricity and matter and the ether together and their forces would have been hopeless, even with you know, Thompson's book. So, so gravity, it turns out, uh, you know, it... it kind of presents itself in these equations, but what I'm determining right now in the process of, uh, of building this chapter uh, is the two forces in the ether, the dielectric and the magnetic, uh, their actions upon matter rather than upon each other in electrical form is actually a third force in the ether and can't strictly be defined as an electrical force, but it's the force that acts on matter. And if that's the case, then that particular uh, set of coordinates could also be the set of coordinates that gravity lives in. So the things that cause matter to attract itself to other matter exist within those coordinates of the ether. That's what I'm starting to see why you know I'm systematically reducing this stuff to geometric and algebraic form so that it's clearly visible as there's a third force involved here. And possibly uh, that could lead to some kind of uh, ether explanation for gravity and how it works because the Einsteinian curve space and the rest of that stuff is useless. It's pure magic. So there has to be something that acts on matter. It can't just be a mathematical equation. There's something pulling or pushing or something. It's got to be there. Uh -huh. So that's the view that Thompson takes, and that's the view that Faraday takes, is that, that uh, quote, Faraday matter cannot act where it is not. In other words, if, if the electromagnetism flying down the power line at 90% of the speed of light, you know, from the transmitting station to the substation pushes the wires apart, which it does, uh, there's something in between that pushes them apart. It's not a result of the curvature of space and obtruse mathematical relationships. It's something real because it pushes the wires apart, and during short circuit conditions, it can rip them off the insulators, and the forces in the substation transformers can reach magnitudes of 50 tons or more. So there's something squeezing around in those coils that wants to get out that just shreds them all up and throws them everywhere. So there must be something real there. That's the uh, that's, that Faraday Thompson point of view. So, if you're saying the the uh, third force or thir uh, of the ether, third, what are the third, first set, two? third the third set of coordinates 
is the way I prefer to say it. But yeah, it could be viewed as, as the third force because magnetic force acts upon magnetic induction and dielectric force acts upon dielectric induction to polarize the ether into those inductions. But the forces they exert on matter are not necessarily in the same set of coordinates, particularly with magnetism. So mag magnetic force circulates around a current carrying conductor. But the force of magnetism upon the conductor is radial, and it compresses the conductor. So if the force of magnetism induces the ether to produce magnetic induction in a circle around the wire that is not in contact with the wire, well, then there has to be another aspect of the ether in between that part that's magnetized and that part that the current occupies in the wire uh, for the force to be carried across. So, so this is, uh, is what I'm kind of getting at. So you have the current is in one set of coordinates, which is along the axis of the conductor. You have the magnetism, which is in another set of coordinates, which are circular, that are extended circumferentially from the conductor. And then you have another set of coordinates, a third set of coordinates that is radial, that is perpendicular to both uh, the circular coordinates of the magnetism and the linear coordinates of the axis of the conductor, yet it is, is not in those two coordinate systems, it's in its own coordinate system. Now, the fact that dielectricity is radial from the conductor's potential, uh, and the forces also act along that direction, tend to give the feeling that, that gravity and electrostatic or dielectric forces are somehow related, and that's what everybody has felt all along. So now I'm kind of getting a little better feel of that too. But this is so, its own avenue of theoretical research, so I'm only going so as far as, you know, so that the reader gets a solid understanding of what's going on in between those wires on the telephone pole before attempting any calculations on it. Uh -huh. um, there's this concept, um, you, you kind of mentioned it, and I, um, and I know it's a, an area that William Lyon is, is uh, looking at researching more, but can you talk a little bit about um, JJ, what JJ Thompson is saying about what electromagnetic momentum is. Okay, well, the situation of electromagnetic momentum. Uh, if you have a mass and you you bring that mass up to speed, in other words, you deliver energy to it. Uh, it the mass doesn't want to slow down. It has inertia. In other words, if you take the energy away, it, it wants to keep going. And if you try to slow it down, energy has to be dissipated. Now, in the, the mind of physics is that momentum and inertia is inside the material object. Uh, the Faraday-Thompson point of view is, the, is completely opposite of that. Uh, you have a situation where the mass is immersed in an electric field consisting of magnetic and dielectric lines of force, and these things can never be made to go away because the universe is filled with them. And the intensity is rather phenomenal, but somehow our senses do not perceive that we have this incredible electrodynamic intensity that we're living in, and that's what keeps everything, you know, lit and moving and alive and all that. So from the Thompson viewpoint, if you have let's say, a metallic sphere, and it's charged a certain electrostatic potential, uh, that basically means that there's a potential difference between that sphere and other material objects at a distance around it. So you have lines of force that project from the surface of the sphere and go off into space to find you know, the companion material that they terminate on somewhere else, whether it be you know, a copper plate on the ground or you know, a distant... Uh, 55-gallon drum in the backyard or whatever because the universe is filled with all these objects. So, so the, the sphere in space is radiating these lines of electric induction. So now when you start to move the sphere through space, you start to carry these lines along and also you're stretching them when they're attached to other objects close by. So, so now you have a resistance to motion. 
And once this thing gets moving and you've applied energy into this resistance of motion, well, now that all this ether and the, line, the lines of force is in motion, it does not want to stop. So the inertia of the physical object in this situation is not inside the object. It's in the space around it. And this is, is the fundamental J.J. Thompson concept, is that inertia and possibly even mass itself is external to the physical object. Mass itself could just easily be you know, an accretion in the ether and the lines of force which fill all space around it. Uh -huh. So in a practical situation, we can take, for example, uh, my automobile. So my automobile exists in space, and it's metallic. And so what's going on is, is uh, you know, there's all the dielectric lines of force from the atmosphere going into the Earth, and the ones from the Earth going, you know, out, and there's Earth's magnetic field, and there's all these things that the matter of the automobile interacts with. So in a certain sense, it's kind of like that charged sphere. So if I want to accelerate the automobile, I have to supply energy to its momentum and inertia where it's stored. And then if I try to slow the automobile down, I have to burn that energy up with resistors, which are called the brakes, and turn it into heat, or I have to deliver it to some kind of load, like, you know, pushing a telephone pole across the ground or moving something, dragging it, or however. But the energy is stored in the inertia. Now, from the J.J. Thompson point of view, if I knew the exact magnostatic and electrostatic potential of the space that the automobile was in, and I magnetized it and charged it electrically to those potentials so there was no potential difference, then there would be no desire for lines of force to connect between the automobile and other objects, and all the lines of force would disappear, and I would be to accelerate or deaccelerate the automobile with no inertia, which means I could either start it or stop it instantly without any consumption of energy. So this is the the proposed theory of how the Air Force uh, Bell Telephone spaceships uh, operate and are able to move around and power themselves and all these things is it, it falls back on the understanding of electricity as developed by J.J. J. Thompson. And, uh, and William Lyon has shown that, you know, much of the alien uh, lore and everything that surrounded all this is basically just a cover-up that uh, that these are all you know devices created by mortals, and the fact that uh, that my operation here is very very close to the place that they do this, and uh, and I've been given some uh, statements about the philosophies involved uh, that Einstein is not welcome in that neighborhood, and that. Uh, that it's actually a very uh, extended part of Bell Telephone Laboratories of advanced knowledge that's never been released to the public, uh, hence, you know, the title of the book, Occult Ether Physics. Right. This we is definitely factual. It's, it's something, you know, people right. go out, sometimes people come visit me and then they want to go out and look at spaceships at night. Uh, you know, these they're not really on display. You're not supposed to see them or whatever. But, you know, if you get on some mountaintop around here and you, you're at the right time, you will see stuff flying around out there that uh, that is not hot air balloons and it's not, you know, landing lights on aircraft. These are and when you say belt, electrodynamic belt, right? craft uh, maneuvering in space. Right. And the Bell Telephone references that pretty much today that has been absorbed into or transformed into basically what Sandia Labs is today? Yeah, as far as I understand. Okay. And one of the times when I was uh, down at your shop, um, parked out back, and uh, I was sleeping in my car, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning, my sunroof is, is uh, was open, and I looked straight up in a black um, uh, craft, w completely silent, making no noise, um, was, I don't know how many hundreds of feet up in the air, I don't know, maybe about a thousand, maybe one to two thousand feet, it wasn't really that, that far up, uh, just gliding silently right over the car and right over the whole town. I just happened to look up just right at that moment and saw one. 
Yeah, well, these things are known to happen around here, and that's kind of why I picked this place yeah. to do what I'm doing. Yeah, some type of electrogravitic propulsion or something like that, but there was no jet noise. You know, definitely was not propeller driven. It wasn't jet, so it was. Uh, you know, even if it has jets for part of the flight, it can turn it off and sustain its own flight completely silent. I guess that, that under the whole uh, thing of electrogravitics, I guess is the uh, the category. Well, that that, that, that could be part of it. You know, and there could be other aspects too. One of the most secret things that exists in the American military, one of the biggest secrets of all is actually something very simple. It's the shape of a submarine propeller. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't make any noise or cavitation. That's mm -hmm. beyond top secret. Mm -hmm. So what, whatever these people have going, you know, from whatever area, uh, they're doing that operation. That stuff is well beyond top secret. Uh, no one's going to tell you about it. No one's going to find out about it. And ultimately, anybody that says that they know something about it uh, is probably going to be full shit. Mm -hmm. So you can approach it, you know, theoretically, like I'm doing, and come up with possible explanations. But what's actually going on is uh, will never be known. So, so in a certain sense, that's a good filtration process because we've got someone talking about, you know, alien uh, abductions or, you know, this and that, and UFOs and whatever, uh, this, you know, or, 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 yeah, I saw this or that, or, you know, I did this or that. Well, you don't get to talk about that stuff because, you know, I live around those people, and believe me, they do not talk. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, the whole thing has to be approached more symbolically and theoretically, and, and, the, and the, the real answer is, will never be forthcoming, but, but nevertheless, we do know this stuff exists, and therefore, you know, it inspires uh, an alternate way of thinking, which we're presently engaged in. Right. Well, this, these concepts with this J.J. Thompson is definitely one of my favorite subjects, and uh, so if you're listening to this and want to look more into this, that the book Electricity and Matter by J.J. Thompson is a, a must read. And if you search online for Electricity and Matter by J.J. Thompson, there's a bunch of free PDFs or you can get it for free at uh, uh, archive.org. Um, you can buy these reprinted copies in uh, Amazon for, for fairly cheap if you want to want to order a paperback. But um, So anyway, Electricity and Matter is, is, is free. You can download it all over the place. And um, I'm definitely looking forward to where your work is going to lead you in, in, this, in this area. And also looking forward to uh, William Lyons' talk at the conference on J.J. Thompson. And um, so, if you want to come meet um, Eric Dollard and William Lyons in person and uh, have a chat about some of these these subjects, come to the 2015 Energy Science and Technology Conference. It's going to be July 10, 11, and 12, uh, middle of July of this year, 2015. It's going to be downtown Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, Coeur d'Alene is um, about maybe 40 minutes. Uh, east of Spokane, Washington, which Spokane is all the way on the east side of Washington State, and so Coeur Lane is just right on the other side of the border, uh, the Idaho border. And uh, we're going to have about 150 people uh, packed in the room. We're going to have about 11 different uh, presentations and a discussion panel. Um, a handful of the speakers are going to be having uh, live demonstrations of uh, some uh, pretty interesting uh, machines. And um, uh, we have about about 100 days left until the conference, so you know, barely over three months. And um, already there's close to only about 60 seats left. And those are going to fill up really quick right at the last moment. And so if you want to go, uh, go to energyscienceconference.com. That's energyscienceconference.com. Click on the registration link and at least get, get your seat reserved right away. And uh, you can click on the, uh, the, the schedule uh, link and go down to the 2015 schedule and you can see what the updated uh, list of uh, speakers is. Uh, it's going to be a jam-packed weekend. It's going to be fun. I think it's going to be another historical conference. And um, Eric's, uh, Eric's talk is going to be the last, the last one um, of the evening on, uh, to close out Sunday. And um, uh, Eric's talk is going to be The Power of Ether as Related to Music and Electricity. 
and it is actually related to uh, uh, what we're talking about right now with uh, uh, JJ Thompson, as uh, Eric explained. Um, is there anything you want to add, Eric, before we wrap it up here? Oh, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. And uh, if you're listening to this, um, uh, we may have already launched uh, Eric's uh, fundraising campaign. You can go to ericpdollard.com. Uh, P stands for Paul, uh, Eric's middle name. So ericpdollard.com. And um, there's a prominent link there going to the fundraising campaign. If you can click on that, you can go there and um, donate what you can. This is to help pay off uh, Eric's lab, uh, the building. Um, uh, recently, about four, over 45000 was uh, paid to David Whittakin to help pay off the original building owner. And so the uh, balance, balance owed is, is uh, getting smaller and smaller all the time. And um, it's an opportunity for EPD Labs to, to be the outright owner of the building. And um, there's a couple of video clips on there. Uh, Adam Bull of the Tesla Society in the, the UK is um, helping to co-administrate that campaign and um, to help uh, get the word out through his network. Uh, he has uh, some interviews um, with Eric. Uh, one of them is already, is already uh, posted, and that's been listed on the interviews section on Eric's website. If you go there and you click on interview, uh, interviews, uh, there's a page with a whole long list of all kinds of interviews with Eric Dollard, including the latest one by Adam Bull. And um, there will be a video on uh, the campaign page where Eric and I are talk going over the, um, the funding that's needed and how, uh, how much money is allocated to each part of the project. And so definitely uh, please donate whatever you can, no matter how, how big or small, um, uh, every bit counts and is greatly appreciated. And uh, even if you're not able to, to donate financially, if you can at least help spread the word, put it out on Facebook, on Twitter, through Google+, um, and uh, let your friends know about it, and uh, just kind of share it around. And uh, uh, anything you can do to help get the word out is appreciated. So I guess with that, we can go ahead and wrap it up, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, uh, your time. Uh, as always, um, this J.J. Thompson stuff is very fascinating. And uh, again, everybody go out and get a copy of Electricity and Matter, read up on that, and that will give you a good primer for uh, what a lot of these concepts are about. And again, it is a book for the layman, uh, as it was a series of lectures uh, for the general public, and um, uh, so it doesn't have a lot of math and stuff, so pretty much anybody can understand it. And uh, I guess with that, thanks a lot, Eric, and uh, we'll, we'll be chatting with you soon. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, talk to you later. Okay, bye.